So I'm going to start. Okay, and we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Smile Shadow Recession. And we are here with Dr. Sonkar, who is a periodontist. And Dr. Sonkar, when you are ready, you can begin. Okay, uh, well, thank you to those who are listening. Thank you for your time. And I hope the content that I'm about to share will throw some light in the field of dentistry and will give you some, uh, will stimulate and ignite some interest as to why do you want to pursue dentistry in the first place. All righty, so I'm going to share my screen. So um, as Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth just introduced me, my name is uh, Jody Sonker. And as you can see, I'm a periodontist by profession. Before I dive in um, to the lecture, I just wanted to um, briefly share my journey with everyone. So the outline would go as the follows. I would talk about myself, my role as a periodontist, my journey, I'll talk about some interesting soft tissue cases. Uh, I would wrap up by, uh, by talking about briefly some tips um, for applying to dental schools. And then we would have some Q&A if you guys have any questions. And then we'll wrap it up by the quiz. So I am Indian by ethnicity and I spent majority of my life in India and I'm from the coastal city of Mumbai. So I pursued my undergraduate degree, my dental degree from India in Mumbai. Uh, my dental school was uh, one of the top city dental schools. And as you can see in the picture, I graduated in 2011 with my dental degree. After that, I worked for about six months at a city hospital. And I moved to United States to pursue my higher education. I moved to Kent, Ohio to pursue my master's degree in public health. So as you can see, that's Kent State University. One, um, just a fun fact, in 2012, uh, while, while I was pursuing my master's in public health, Kent State University was awarded as one of the most greenest campus in the United States. So I found that to be really um, interesting because yes, it's indeed, uh, there's a lot of green lawns in between the dental school building. And um, just, just a fun fact, just to have that like, yes, it's really green uh, compared to now when I'm in Boston, it's all buildings. So just, yeah. So after I pursued my master's in public health, um, I was majorly interested in occupational health and uh, safety. Uh, this is a branch of um, public health that deals with healthcare professionals and some of the occupational health hazards that they may face. And this degree really helps me as an educator and as a, as a clinician and gives me a different perspective. So if anyone who's interested in public health, feel free to reach out to me after the lecture, email me or reach out to me through my social media and I'm more than happy to uh, throw some light as to why did I pursue my public health and how does that actually help me in my dental career. So moving on, after my public health, I moved on to Memphis, Tennessee, where I pursued AGD from UT, School of Dentistry in Memphis. There I pursued, um, I was interested in periodontics and I was really interested in dental implants. So I wanted to get more restorative knowledge, uh, get into more um, um, the restorative part, the prosthetic part of the dental implants that I might not get uh, to learn in my journey as a periodontic. So the AGD really helped me gain that aspect and really strengthen my knowledge, not just as a surgeon, but also, but also as a perio, uh, restorative uh, perio uh, journey. So now when I plan my implants, I have quite a strong knowledge of my prosthetic and restorative aspect. And 
my journey in AGD really helped me with that. After I finished, it was a one year degree. So after I finished uh, my one year certificate degree in AGD, I moved on to New Orleans, Louisiana to pursue my master's in periodontics. It was a three year degree and I got a master's and a certificate um, degree when I graduated. And New Orleans was one of the best times in my life. Um, more so because I was pursuing and graduating in a degree that I really wanted to. And at the same time, New Orleans was a fun city. I mean, three years just flew by. I enjoyed my time in Mardi Gras, in Red Restaurant, um, watched a bunch of games in Superdome and, and ate quite a bit of good food. So I really had a blast in New Orleans. So moving on, so my dental degree, my dental journey, after my BDS, I got a dental degree in BDS since I graduated from India. So it was five years of my undergraduate dental degree plus six years of my master's in public health, AGD and periodontics. So it really took me about 11 years to be where I am today. So following, to kind of give you a, a bit of a, an insight after I graduated from periodontics, what I'm doing. So as you can see, my first two pictures is during my final years of my graduation. Um, this is me as a resident and my faculties um, seeing my work. As you can see, uh, a lot of uh, my surgeries that I did was through microsurgery. Yes, I did have a microscope and here's a patient. So LSU gave me an edge because it's one of the few, and if I must say one or one or two uh, residency in this country that trains you in microsurgery. So basically I do periodontal procedures, but right under the microscope. And I also teach uh, microsurgery. I also teach suturing on pig jaws. And why do I do uh, the procedures under microsurgery? Well, it's uh, there's quite a bit of benefit. Ergonomically, I always have my back straight. Um, it, it's better for me in the long run. Uh, for the patient, it's minimally invasive surgery. And um, the patient will basically have no trauma when they walk out of the surgery. They have little to no sutures and that means they heal pretty fast and they don't even feel like that they have they've undergone a surgery and as a result um, they have faster healing they have better patient experience and for me as a surgeon i'm able to provide a, a very um, clean cut I get a big uh, zoomed out view um, because the, the surgical field is pretty much amplified on the screen. So I can pretty much see, which I might not just see in the traditional loops. Uh, so it's a win-win situation for the patient and for me as a surgeon. The caveat is, yes, you're gonna take a little bit more time uh, while you're doing a surgery in a microscope. So let's say if I'm doing a soft tissue procedure with my traditional loops, I might take anywhere between 60 to 90 minutes. With the microsurgery, it might take me at least two hours to two and a half hours for the same procedure, but you make up the money because the overhead is something you charge, but the patient gets the best of the experience. On the right side, I this is where I teach I am a periodontist. I'm also a clinical assistant professor at Boston University in Massachusetts. So I routinely conduct pig jaw exercises where I teach my students how to suture on a pig jaw head. So they, this experience gives them a much more uh, better grasp on how would they suture when they're suturing on an actual patient. And I think a lot of my students appreciate it and they benefit a lot from this uh, workshops that I conduct. And they are a bit, a tit bit more confident when they're suturing an extraction site or they're, ex uh, they're suturing um, a biopsy site and it really helps them build their skill. This is something that not every dental school offers. So this workshops really helps us, helps uh, them uh, overcome their fear. 
So moving on, moving on to the main topic of today, I'm sure you, you've attended a lot, a lot of virtual shadowing lectures from different periodontists to oral surgeons. This is a, a bit different in a way where I'm actually introducing the concept of soft tissue grafting, uh, what it is and why would you actually graft? Uh, I'm sure with all the past virtual shadowing sessions, you've heard about gingival recession and then grafting with a soft tissue. Uh, my uh, unique point here is why do you actually want to graft? Let me tell you, by the time you, you turn 30, most of us will have a soft tissue recession in our mouth. It's just the way how we age. It's the wear and tear of our body. You're going to find a couple of recessions. I have a few recessions, but you don't really have to graft every recession, a gingival recession that you see. So there's really an indication. You don't want to jump on every gingival recession that you see in a patient and tell them that, hey, listen, you need a graft. It's not required. So, so in today's lecture, I'm briefly going to introduce you to the field, to the concept of what a gingival recession is, uh, what's the anatomical features around it, and uh, show you some of my own cases and introduce you to the field of when, as a periodontist, I would suggest my patient to graft. So if you have any questions, type away and I'll try my best to answer. So we start by what do you mean by a gingival recession? As you can see in the photo, a gingival recession is merely an exposure of the root surface and a shift of the gingival recession from, from this position to the apical position. So whenever your soft tissue moves away from, from the junction of the tooth, there is a gingival recession. I'm trying to use a very layman term because I understand most of my audience are pre-dental students, so they're still learning the dental terminology. So just, I'm gonna try my best to use a non-dental term, or as you say, as I'm, I'll talk as if I'm talking to my patients so you guys are able to better understand, all right? So this is a gingival margin, and when the gingiva moves away, that's when a gingival recession is created. As you can see, compared to adjacent teeth, the gingiva is right at this margin. But in this area, it's not, it's moved away. So that's what we call it as a gingival recession. Now in our field of dentistry, the recession is classified uh, by Miller's classification. It's one of the most commonly used classification. And just to, before I dive deep into what a class, what a Miller type one, class one, class two classification is, just understand, this is our mouth, this is our gums, this is uh, the tooth, this is the gingiva, this is known as an attached gingiva. An attached gingiva is a firm band of gingiva that is firmly attached to the tooth. This is the junction, and then beyond this junction is loose tissue. So this is attached gingiva. This is the junction known as mucogingival junction. And then beyond that, you have very loose flabby tissue known as alveolar tissue. So this is how you're going to see in a patient's mouth. So a class one recession means where your gingiva, meaning your gum has moved away from the margin, but when it's moved away, it's still within this junction. It has, this recession has not crossed beyond the junction. So it's a very simple recession. So this is known as class one. A class two recession would be when the gingiva, the gingival recession is at the junction, at the mucogingival junction. It's not crossed beyond, but it's within the, within the attached tissue or at the gingival junction. And at the same time, there is no loss of uh, soft tissue that you can see. It's, you still have good amount of soft tissue, you still have good amount of bone, but the recession compared to class one is right at the junction. Here you can see it's within the junction, but here it's right at the junction. So that's class two. In a class three, it's gonna go beyond the junction 
And at the same time, you're going to see some black triangles, meaning there is some loss of soft tissue, there is some loss of bone radiographically. So it's a bit more severe. The most severe type of a gingival recession is a class four, where the gingival recession is going beyond the mucogingival junction. Again, this is the mucogingival junction. This is the attached tissue, and this is the loose flabby tissue, also known as the alveolar mucosa. So gingival recession has gone beyond, and you can see there is massive loss of soft tissue, massive loss of bone. You can see black triangles. You can see a lot of root exposed. And let me tell you, if you see a recession like this, it's really hard to treat. So hope uh, you guys are following me. Feel free to ask any questions. I'll be more than happy to. So moving on. So now we know what are different kinds of recessions and how they are classified. Let's review some of the basic anatomy. So as you can see, you have teeth, you have a free gingival margin. A free gingival margin is where the teeth ends and your soft tissue starts. This is the nice thick band of attached gingiva where the gums are pristine, there is no recession, they're, they're attached to the bone. This is the mucogingival junction and beyond this you have alveolar mucosa. This mucosa is just some loose flabby tissue and it doesn't really serve, um, it's just a part of the vestibule. Uh, this is something you're gonna learn more, but as a periodontist, this is what is important to us. And as a dentist, it's what is important to you as well. If there's any issue going on in the band of tissue, the patient is gonna have some problems. So again, this area is a free gingival margin where this is again a part of our um, gingiva. And then beyond that, you have attached gingiva. Free gingival margin is FG, attached gingiva is AG. It's a good band of tissue, anywhere between five to seven millimeters, actually minimum one to maximum up to seven millimeters. You wanna have that in a patient. So good amount of uh, attached gingiva. This is the junction known as mucogingival junction. And then beyond that, you just have some loose flabby tissue known as the alveolar mucosa. Okay, this is loose flabby, this keeps moving. This tissue attached gingiva ideally shouldn't move. When you're touching and you're using your, your fingertips to feel it, it shouldn't be moving. It should be, uh, it should be firm, pink and healthy. Okay, and this junction, um, the tissue side of the area is known as the free gingival margin. The tooth side of the area is known as CJ, that is cemental and enamel junction. This is where your enamel from the, from the crown is gonna meet and your cementum from the root is gonna meet. So that is known as the CJ. That's usually where your gingival margin is gonna rest. I hope I'm making sense to you guys. And I'm, again, I'm trying to be as layman as possible as if I'm explaining to my patients, okay? So just a little bit more. This is your attached um, uh, attach, uh, gingiva. So an attached gingiva plus the free gingival margin is known as cretinized tissue. So you're gonna hear a word cretinized tissue a lot of times. So don't get confused. The attached gingiva is not similar to cretinized tissue. Attached gingiva plus free gingival margin equals cretinized tissue. This means this part of the gingiva has keratin. And the tissue beyond the mucogingival junction, that is the alveolar mucosa, which is loose flabby tissue, doesn't really have keratin. Only the tissue beyond the free mucogingival junction, that is the free gingival margin and the attached gingiva has the keratin. And that's the reason why it's called as keratinized tissue. Now this term is important for when I'm talking about my cases and for you guys to understand. And that's the reason why I'm spending quite a bit of time for you guys to understand what I'm gonna talk about. So understand your free gingival margin plus attached gingiva equals cretinized tissue. Moving on, why am I talking so much about attached gingiva? 
Attached uh, gingiva is really important to us as a periodontist and to some amount to you guys as a aspiring dentist. Uh, and that's because uh, just to kind of give you some classic literature, Bowers, Lang and Lowe and Wenstrom, they're like some really top notch um, researchers. Some of them are alive and some of them are not alive anymore. They did some really important studies. Um, just to uh, give you some brief information, an attached gingiva can range anywhere between one millimeters to nine millimeters. There is no attached, um, there is attached gingiva on the buckle, on the lingual aspect, and attached gingiva um, increases in width from deciduous, meaning from milk teeth, when, uh, when humans have primary teeth, meaning milk teeth or deciduous teeth. Uh, and when the teeth fall off, when they have adult teeth, that's the secondary dentition, the attached gingiva increases in width, and it is important that it needs to increase in width. And the attached gingiva can differ in the thickness because of tooth being in different position, because of uh, some muscle attachments, um, it can differ. And that is an important aspect for us periodontists and for you dentists uh, to understand while you're making any treatment plans. So a good band of gin attached gingiva is really, oops, really important. So why is it important? It is important for the integrity of your gums. If you have an attached gingiva less than a millimeter, your gums uh, starts to get inflamed, no matter how much uh, oral hygiene a patient maintains. So this is a classic article that talks about uh, having at least two millimeters of keratinized tissue and within that, at least one millimeter of attached gingiva. Now there's a different school of thought. Lang and Lowe um, thought that we really need to have two millimeters of keratinized tissue. And a lot of uh, today's dentists and periodontists do agree with him. Whereas there was this one other a researcher known as Wenstrom that thought that, oh, if you have a good oral hygiene, it doesn't matter if you don't have any keratinized tissue, it's okay. But in reality, uh, from my own experience in my practice, you're not gonna really get a lot of patients that have good oral hygiene. So that's, a, that's where uh, having at least two millimeters, millimeters of keratinized tissue is really important. Yes, if, you, if a patient doesn't have any keratinized tissue for whatever reason, if the patient has good oral hygiene, not a problem. But trust me, if you are a practicing dentist, 99% of your patients, I would say 99.99% of your patients have a good um, chance that they're not going to have good oral hygiene. And that's the reason why in our body, we need to have cutinized tissue to fight off that lack of good oral hygiene. So one of the accepted uh, millimeters is a patient has good healthy mouth they should have ideally at least a two millimeters of healthy gums so that uh, if they don't have good oral hygiene, your gums are at least fighting on behalf of you from those bacteria, from those uh, plaque that you accumulate. So a little bit more into the anatomy. When we talk about gums, uh, patients have um, different kinds of gums. They have something known as thick biotype and they have something known as thin biotype. Now, a patient that has a thick biotype will ideally, if you measure the gums, the thick biotype is more than two millimeters. Such patients have thick underlying bone. So if they have any trauma in the mouth, they're more than able to uh, manage that trauma. Let's say if you're brushing too hard, a thick biotype uh, gums is gonna handle that much stress and not have any recession. Whereas a patient that has a thin biotype where the gums is less than two millimeters and the underlying bone is also thin. So let's say if they're brushing too hard, they're more likely to develop a recession. And again, how do you know if it's a thick or a thin biotype? Well, it's genetic. Any man and women uh, may genetically have a thick biotype or a thin biotype. Ideally, a petite female will tend to have a thin biotype and a big bulky uh, man 
will tend to have a thick biotype. But, uh, but again, it's not always true. So the only way for you to find out is during your consultations. When you see a patient for your first appointment, I evaluate uh, my gingival biotypes in my patients. And whenever I'm planning any surgeries, I let them know the expectations and I let them know if they're, if they're thick biotype or thin biotype, how that biotype is gonna affect the treatment plan. A thick biotype patients heal much more faster. They heal without any complications if I'm doing any soft tissue surgery or any bone surgery. Whereas a thin biotype, they heal well too, but they have a little window of error where they might have some complications just because they have a thinner biotype, they have less blood supply and things like that. So that's one of the things I evaluate in my patients in my first appointment and let them know. Hope I'm making some sense to you guys. So moving on, this is how a thin biotype will look. As you can see, uh, there's an implant underlying. So a thin biotype uh, patients will show this underlying implant. And when you probe around uh, in the natural light, the probe is gonna be seen. Whereas this is another example of a thin biotype. One other in interesting fact, patients that have longer teeth or have triangular teeth, they're more likely to have a thin biotype uh, uh, architecture. So next time you see any patient that has long triangular teeth, they're more likely to have a thin biotype. On the other hand, a thick gingival biotype, patients are gonna have square teeth. You see, compared to this photo, this is a triangle teeth. And compared to this photo, this is more of a squarish uh, teeth. So they have shorter teeth compared to the thin biotype. And uh, this is just one of the observations made, made by one of the very famous researchers. So whenever I have uh, my patient in my chair and I'm doing a consultations, I'm gonna take a look at the biotype. I'm gonna take a look at the size of their uh, tooth, the shape of their tooth. All of this information really helps me as a surgeon in planning my uh, surgeries. Once you guys get into dentistry and are actually um, learning more about treatment planning, all of this aspect is really gonna help you. And as you can see, the probe is not readily seen underneath the tissue, which means the tissue is really thick. So it's not reflected uh, under light. So that's what I meant by the biotypes. So let's talk about grafting. So I talked about gingival recession, how gingival recession is classified. Then I touched base with uh, basic anatomy in the mouth and um, how the gums are and what do you mean by biotypes. So when do you actually would suggest a patient that, okay, I see a gingival recession in your mouth and uh, I will advise you to get a graft. So when do we actually do that? So let's look into that. So as you can see, you would usually tell a patient uh, that the patient would need a soft tissue grafting when the patient is not having any keratinized tissue. Remember the anatomy, you have the free gingival margin, you have a thick attached uh, tissue. This is the mucogingival junction and then this is the alveolar mucosa that is flabby tissue. Look at this tooth, it literally has no keratinized tissue. In this tooth, the area has no keratinized tissue. Keratinized tissue is really important because when the plaque accumulates here, um, let's say the patient is not very good at cleaning, this keratinized tissue is gonna help uh, fight off any of this bacteria that's stuck in this plaque and, not, and protect the teeth from the bacteria getting deep inside and affecting the gums. So if you don't have a keratinized tissue, you wanna graft and make sure that all the healthy teeth have uh, keratinized tissue. So this is one of the reasons why you would tell the patient that yes, you really need a soft tissue grafting. Another problem, you have keratinized tissue, but it's not adequate. Remember one of the authors, a researcher I, I quoted, uh, Langen Low, he mentioned that you really need to have at least two millimeters of keratinized tissue. So when a patient, patient has less than two millimeters, as you can see, you want to tell the patient that yes, you need soft tissue grafting because, because a patient that has less 
keratinized tissue, they usually would have a lot of bleeding. They will have thin gingival um, tissue and they're more vulnerable to uh, developing a recession in the future. So I don't wait for the patient to develop a recession. When I see a situation like this, I would tell the patient that right now, if you do a soft tissue grafting, you have a better chance of success um, compared to when you develop a recession and then I do a soft tissue grafting. So this is something I would do, um, I would assess in my first visit with the patient. Excuse me. I would, um, I would determine what's the patient's um, gingival biotype is. I'll determine what's the patient's uh, shape of the tooth is. I'll determine what the keratinized tissue is. If it's there, if it's missing, or if it's uh, inadequate. I would make all of those assessments in my first visit. The next um, situation when I would tell the patient that the patient needs grafting is mucogingival defect. Now, what is a mucogingival defect? You see a tooth, here the patient has a recession. However, patient has keratinized tissue. Um, patient has mucogingival junction. Patient has this alveolar mucosa. So ideally this attached uh, gingiva should be firmly attached to the tooth uh, and firmly be attached to the bone, as you can see here. And when I probe, the probe shouldn't go beyond this mucogingival junction. In some patients, the probe goes beyond the mucogingival junction. That means patient has a good keratinized tissue, but it's not firmly attached to the bone. It's not attached to the tooth. As you can see, the probe is going beyond the junction into the alveolar mucosa. That's not good because eventually the plaque, the fluid is gonna get deep inside this and this is gonna cause even more recession. So when I see a mucogingival defect, despite patient having attached gingiva, I tell the patient that you need a soft tissue grafting. The soft tissue grafting will not only uh, allow this attached uh, tissue to become firmly attached, it will also fix this recessions. So this is another indication patient will need soft tissue grafting. Hope I'm making sense. Again, feel free to ask me questions. And, and I do understand this is a bit of an advanced topic, but I'm just giving you a, a different take on um, periodontics. Uh, I'm sure you, you're attending a lot more lectures from different periodontics. This is one of the unique things that I'm bringing your attention to and to tell you how marvelous periodontics is and how much I love it because of all of these and things that we as periodontists get to treat. Next thing where a patient needs a soft tissue grafting is this muscle attachment. This is known as a frenum. Everybody has them. And this is basically just a band of muscles that is attached. Ideally, a frenum is a natural, naturally occurring phenomenon and it doesn't uh, cause us any problem. But, but when the frenum is attached this close into the attached gingiva and this close to the free gingival margin, it can cause problems. It will constantly pull on this area and actually cause a gingival recession over the period of time. So some patients have this. Genetically, they have this uh, frenum, which is really hyperactive, which is really, um, really hyper. Uh, and it's really high attached. Usually the frenums are attached at this level and this patient is attached a bit higher. And that's why it's known as aberrant frenum, meaning it's abnormal. It's not something commonly you're gonna see in a patient. So this is something um, when you see in the patient, uh, I would suggest that yes, patient will need gingival, gingival um, soft tissue grafting to um, deal with this. This is, this is another indication. So let's talk about what are the other indications. Clinically, I told you certain, I showed you certain cases. Um, what are the other uh, factors that will um, allow the periodontist to make a decision that yes, you need um, grafting? One of, the, this is, one of the things that you see in a MRI scan, in a CT scan is thin bone. 
Ideally, this is the tooth. This is the buccal uh, board of the mandible. A mandible is the lower jaw. Ideally, you want to you want to see some amount of bone here. And as you can see in this picture, there is very little bone. So this patient, where over the period of time, will bound to develop a gingival recession just because there's no underlying bone. So as a periodontist, when I'm looking at a scan. I'm going to let the patient know that, listen, you have really thin bone. Maybe this patient is a thin biotype. Maybe this patient has thin gingiva and thin underlying bone. And this patient is really susceptible and vulnerable to gingival recession. So this is one of the reasons why I might suggest a patient to do a soft tissue grafting. Another problem, some patients, as you can see, again, this is something you can see in a CT scan. Patient might have gums, they might have gingiva right at the CJ, at the free gingival margin, but underneath, they might not have bone. It's again, a very naturally occurring phenomena. And this is known as dehiscence. A dehiscence is a situation where patient clinically will have the gums, they're perfectly fine, but the underlying bone is missing. You cannot detect this phenomena directly by looking at the patient's mouth clinically you'll only see this on a CT scan. As a preventative measure, if I accidentally uh, come across this dehiscence, I'm gonna let my patient know that, hey, you, you've already lost a lot of bone and it's just a matter of time, you're gonna lose the overlying gums. And once you lose that, your chances for a success in the surgery is gonna drop down. So let's do this. Let's do it right now as a preventative me measure. Uh, you're gonna have a much more success. And lastly, when will I suggest a patient that the patient needs gingival uh, soft tissue grafting is when, when their tooth is really uh, placed very prominently. As you see, we have this arch. The arch is usually semi-circle and the teeth are supposed to be in a certain position. Sometimes genetically, uh, patients have uh, teeth that are uh, jutted out into the arch. They're too much far ahead or too much far behind. So in a patient where the teeth are genetically too much far ahead, they're more likely to lose bone and they're more likely to have thin biotype and they're more likely to have a gingival recession. So in such patients, I would suggest them soft tissue grafting. Sometimes these patients will undergo orthodontic treatment to move the tooth back or uh, sometimes they might not just because naturally and genetically they just have all their teeth really out in the arch and they might not wanna undergo orthodontic treatment. So in that situation, I would suggest um, soft tissue grafting just because it's better for their health, it's better for their uh, mouth. So reduce bone thickness, presence of dehiscence and malaligned teeth, like really prominent teeth, buckly, Buckley meaning the tooth is really front compared to the rest of the tooth in the jaw, a very prominent teeth. These are the uh, patients that might need soft tissue grafting from the beginning, all right? So what causes recession? Apart from the fact that uh, tooth brushing trauma, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you certain examples. Patients who have bad oral hygiene or that have gum disease are bound to develop gingival recession. Um, if you're not taking care of your mouth, uh, you're going to get gum disease. And in gum disease, your, so your soft tissue, meaning your gums are going to break down. They're not be able to hold up. Uh, there's going to be constant attack from the plaque, like from the food that's stuck in the mouth. And for people who brush, but they don't brush with, um, uh, they don't brush properly or they don't spend that much time brushing, gum disease is going to happen and this gum disease is eventually going to break down the soft tissue and that's going to cause recession. And recessions in is not really good for your uh, teeth because A, it's when you smile, when you smile it's really ugly. Uh, you're going to see those ugly exposed uh, roots and B, it's not really good for the health of your teeth. If you have recession, you're going to lose underlying bone. And if you don't treat it over the period of time, your, your tooth will start to get loose because your, your tooth is losing that bone. It's losing that soft tissue and your tooth might start moving. And in a severe situation, it might just fall out. So you don't really want recession. 
it's not healthy for your mouth. So poor oral hygiene, gum disease is one of the major causes. Periodontal treatment, sometimes we periodontists will do certain procedures that might lead to recession. And um, it's a compromise. Uh, we do these, situ these situations arise when we get patients that have so much severe damage that we have to do a surgery at the cost of causing gingival recession. So it's not an ideal situation, but yes, certain, certain patients will have to have that compromise just because the, the mouth has gone, has undergone so much damage that the only way to save them is to cause some damage, but at the same time, do some surgeries that will just save their teeth. So in this situation, it's not the matter of aesthetics, it's the matter of survival. So yes, certain periodontal treatments can cause a recession. And then age, as I mentioned, after the age of 30 years, a lot of people, no matter as a periodontist, how much care I take, how much dentally aware I am, I'm still gonna develop a recession. It's just a part of life. It's just a wear and tear of your body. So again, just because you get a recession doesn't mean you have to treat it. As a dentist, when you see your patients, you will think about it. Just because you see a recession, just don't uh, tell that you need to treat it. I gave you certain indications where you have to suggest patients of tissue grafting. Look for those indications, not just because you have a recession and you're like, hey, buddy, you have a recession, we have to treat it. It's not always required. The next, one of the most major causes of gingival recession and most popular cause is toothbrushing. We people, sometimes we get up in the morning, we are getting late to school, we're getting late to work, we just keep brushing. We don't realize that the style of brushing can cause uh, damage to your gums. Uh, the number of times we brush, some patients brush like two to four times, trust me. If you brush more, it's a problem. You brush too hard, it's a problem. The style of brushing, there's a different kinds of brushing techniques that you're gonna learn in dental school. So certain brushing techniques are not good. So you just like brush, like you're scrubbing, it's not good for your gums and your bristles. You have soft bristles, you have medium bristles, and you have hard bristles. Older generation, like our parents, our grandparents, they are, they are of the philosophy that more harder the bristles, the better it is. It's actually wrong. You don't want hard bristles. You, don't, you want to buy a soft uh, bristle brush that's gentle on your gums. And it's a technique, not the force. The technique of the brushing that actually is important. So very common cause of developing recessions. The next thing is piercing. Any sort of lip piercing, tongue piercing is strongly associated with the recession in that area. All right, so just uh, moving on, we'll take a look at some of uh, the cases. All of these cases that I show are my own, unless I have given um, some courtesy uh, in down in the photos. Uh, most of the cases are my own. As you can see, this was a 12 year old patient of mine that literally had very limited keratinized tissue. And this patient needed orthodontic treatment. So the orthodontist told me that, hey, if I do braces, this is gonna really get worse. So can you do some soft tissue? So this area is strong and healthy and can withstand the forces that I, will, uh, I would put during, my, during the braces. So this 12 year old kid came to my office. I was able to do a soft tissue grafting. This is a graft that I took from the roof of the patient's mouth and attached it here. Can you see the difference? Yes, it's a bit ugly, but when you smile, it's not gonna be seen. But what's more important is this area is gonna be really strong. It can withstand the braces force and it's really good. The, the teeth are gonna be able to take care of itself. So this is where it's important for the health of the mouth. Not very aesthetic, but this is how we do. So this is known as a free gingival graft, where I took a part of the tissue from the roof of the patient's mouth and I attached it in the gingival. Hence the name free gingival graft. And autogenous meaning it's the patient's own tissue. Next case, 
Three ginger grab. Patient had some recession. Patient had some very limited cartilage tissue. Patient constantly had bleeding, and the recession was increasing every six months to a year when I'm see seeing him. In this case, I did not use patient's own tissue. I used a mucograft. It's an artificial derived tissue um, that I added. You see, it looks like a sponge. We use this when patients a don't want to have another surgery. They don't want to. They don't want me to bother their roof of the mouth. B, if the quality of the tissue in the roof of the mouth is very limited, uh, might not be a good area for uh, grafting. Um, these are the situations where I'll go for a mucograft, meaning it's not the patient's own tissue, it's an artificial tissue. This is how I add it. And I, this is where you see uh, a nice band of fertilized tissue. It's only three months, so it's still healing. Now keep in mind, you're gonna see, oops, you're gonna see recession, you're gonna see a recession here as well. And the reason why there's still recession because this is a Miller class three recession. As you can see, there is some black triangles. So when you have a Miller class three type of recession, you are never ever gonna cover the area of the recession completely. Just because it's anatomy, it's physiology. You're gonna learn about this in dentistry. Your bone doesn't have that much blood supply left to cause complete coverage of the recession. So in a class three, your only win-win situation is you get more cretinized tissue and maybe some resolve, some coverage of the recession, but never complete. So that's why I got some coverage of the recession and I got more cretinized tissue. So that was my goal. This is the mucogingival junction here. So you, I got a big fat five to six millimeters of cretinized tissue compared to one to two millimeters. This is a mucogingival junction. So the cretinous tissue was really uh, thin, like a millimeter. And here you have like five to six millimeters. So talking more about mucograft, what is it? It's not patient's own tissue. It's uh, derived from pig. So it's not pig tissue. It's basically, uh, this is like a sponge. It, uh, it, uh, it has some tissues derived from the pig. And those tissues are dry. They don't have any DNA. They don't have any, any other uh, component of the cells that might cause infection in humans. It's just a scaffold, it's just a structure. And when I add this mucograph in the patient, this mucograph is gonna stimulate. It's gonna stimulate, like it's gonna like poke the surrounding patient's tissue to regenerate. So that's how it works. This is like the most simplest way I can explain you guys. It's really fabulous. It's really amazing how these things can work for us. So this is mucograph for y'all. So next uh, example, another patient, um, it's a Miller class uh, three type of recession. As you can see, a lot of black triangles. Patient has a recession patient but has really thin tissue. So my goal here is to increase curtainized tissue and maybe get some partial coverage of the recession. So here I used patient's own tissue. This is the patient's roof of the mouth. So as you can see, I took a piece of the tissue from the patient's roof of the mouth. I added it here. And this is how it healed in about three to four months. And where I took the tissue out, I added some sponge. This area is just gonna heal on its own. There's a hole, I added some sponge, it's just gonna heal in about a month. Uh, and I, I took this uh, big fat tissue, I added it here in this area. Look at this, look at the difference. It's so thin here and see how thick and nice and pink it is and how big, big of the curtainized tissue. Yes, we haven't covered the recession, but it's really not possible because of this black triangles, we can cover the recession. So in this area, we just want more thick tissue. So that was my goal and I was able to get it. So this is a comparison. Mucograph versus patient's own thick tissue. One, one observation I like to tell you, your own tissue is the best. Like you look at the healing, look at the cretinized tissue here and look at the cretinized tissue here. This is more thick, this is more human-like, and this is a little bit 
like it's good, but this is, I would want it to heal a bit more. So what I'm trying to get is, if you use your own tissue, it's gold standard. Um, but sometimes that's not always uh, realistic. So we sometimes use mucograft, which is artificial. You still get the healing. It's good, but it's not the best. Moving on, another case, I had a patient that had recession. This is the front tooth, this is the canine, like here. Patient did not like this recession. So she was like, can you, uh, can you do some magic? Can you do some soft tissue grafting? Can you fix this? I was like, sure, I did some soft tissue grafting. It's still healing. It's still a month after surgery, it's healing. And this is how it is 1.5 years later. Look, there is no recession. Look at how the quality of tissue has improved. This is, uh, 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 this is the left side and this is the right side of the same patient. Patient had a lot of recession. Look at the recession. I, I added some soft tissue. It's healing, it's a month. It's a month old and look at it uh, 1.5 years later. And this is the whole tooth. Look at the patient's recessions, this big ugly filling recession and look at the dentition right now like this is 1.5 years after i did the surgery now what did i use here it's a connected tissue graft it's kind of like a tissue graft where i take it from the roof of the patient's mouth but this graft is just a connective tissue aspect compared to this graft which is a free gingival oops this is a free gingival graft where it's just the epithelium and the connective tissue. This one is just a connective tissue and not the epithelium. Now you will ask me, why did I not take the epithelium? The epithelium, are, they, they're a bit more, when they heal, they're a bit more ugly. So we use it in the areas where when, you, when the patient smiles, it's not seen. We use connective tissue grafts in the area where the patient or needs an aesthetic area where when they're smiling, um, they don't want the gums to look ugly. And both a pre gingival graft and connective tissue graft has its own advantages and disadvantages. And we use one or the other in specific cases. This is something you wanna learn in dentistry, but just to kind of give you a brief introduction, like there are different kinds of soft tissue grafting. So connective tissue graft is more aesthetic. As you can see, I would do this kind of a grafting where when the patient smiles, the gums are seen and patient cares, they demand a more uh, beautiful smile. I would do a connective tissue graft rather than a free gingival graft. Another case, this patient did very hard brushing for at least 30 years of her life. So look what happened when he brushed so hard she literally brushed away the gums and brushed away a part of the root. This is middle class three, so it's really impossible to completely cover the coverage. You're not gonna get full coverage ever on this patient just because it was too late when she came to me. The recession is really severe, but it really bothered her smile. It caused her pain. So we were like, you know what? Let's try to do it. now. Keep in mind, this is like a full mouth recession. There is no way you're gonna get so much tissue from the patient's own mouth. At least not from, not from a living human being. You're not being able to get such a big amount of uh, connected tissue. So what did I did? I used an alloderm. This is not from the patient's own uh, mouth. This is an artificial tissue that I used. This is different from the mucograft. Mucograft is more like a free gingival graft. Alloderm is an artificial graft, very similar to a connective tissue. So what is this? The mucograft that I mentioned before was derived from pigs. Now this one is derived from human cadaver. This is again an artificial tissue, meaning it's not actual tissue. It is kind of a sponge that has a lot of cells from dead human bodies, but the cells don't have any um, DNA or any of those cellular materials that can cause infection. Perfectly safe to use. Like if it were to me, and if I had to use this, I would use this alloderm in my own mouth. Really uh, effective, has 30 to 40 years uh, worth of research, really works well. I use alloderm in cases where I need like full mouth coverage 
and um, patient, I can't take that much tissue from the patient's mouth. So this is uh, the soft tissue uh, procedure that I did. I opened the gum flap. I added the alloderm. This is how alloderm looks. It looks like a scaffold. And then I tried to pull the gums uh, to cover it. And this is how it looked before the surgery. At the time of the surgery, uh, I tried to pull the, I put the alloderm on, on this area. I tried to pull the patient's gums to completely cover it. But as I told you, it's a class three recession. It's not gonna ever be covered. Just the way how it heals. It's partially covered. As you see, it went back. And compared to this, I got some partial coverage of the recession. So this is like my win-win. This is how I'm gonna get it. And this is the maximum amount of success I can get it. So just an example for you guys, when you treat a very severe case, you would not, you're not always gonna get a very like successful result. This is the compromise results. Patient understood it and she was happy with this. This is the other side of the patient's mouth. This is the alloderm. I tried to pull the gums down and this is how it looked before the surgery, at the time of the surgery and at the healing. So this is how it looked before the surgery and a month after the surgery. I mean, there are some recession, but it's so much better compared to uh, what it was before. So keep in mind, this is just the top part that I'm showing. I am not showing you the lower part. This is the top part of the maxilla that I did the surgery. By maxilla, I mean the upper jaw, okay? Moving on, another case. Now this area, this is number 21. Patient had kidney disease. So ideally, um, I would have pulled this tooth out because the tooth had a lot of decay underneath the gums and it was really difficult to treat. And in a healthy patient, I would have just pulled the tooth out and have put an implant just because there was so much decay underneath the gums. However, this patient had kidney problems and did not get a medical clearance for such a big uh, dental surgery. So implants was not an option. So what did I do? I worked with my general dentist. Um, patient had this filling. The filling had a lot of decay underneath and that decay went inside the gums as well. So my general dentist took out the filling. Uh, my general dentist also cleaned the decay as much as possible. And then what I did, I did a tunnel technique, meaning I did not completely expose the flap. I, as you can see, you can see my pro probe is going through and through. I created a pouch. And once you are a dentist, when you, once you're learning dentistry, you're gonna understand why I did that. This is just because I didn't wanna jeopardize the blood supply. It's one of the many techniques that we as a periodontist can do uh, tissue grafting. So what I did was I did, I created this pouch. So through this pouch, my general dentist was able to clean the decay underneath this gums and was able to put some sort of a cement that's, uh, uh, that can thrive in the wet environment. And she was able to do that. And then I was able to push a connective tissue graft that I took from the patient's roof of the mouth. I pushed it through this pouch. And there was a reason for it because this area, this was really a delicate surgery. So I did not really want to expose it just because I was worried that uh, it was not going to heal properly. So I did this technique. This is known as a tunneling technique, meaning I created a tunnel. And after the surgery, I put in the connective tissue graft. And this is, this is the area, this is the connective tissue graft. My general dentist did not uh, put the restorative, uh, uh, did not put any filling just yet because my gums were still healing. So you, in this area, all my general dentist did was she filled, she put some filling underneath in the roots, but she left this uh, open so that, um, so that I could put my connective tissue graft. And as you can see, my soft tissue is healing. And you don't wanna fill this right away. You want the soft tissue to heal. You wanna see how it's healing. So a month later, it healed right at the free general margin. So my general dentist had um, space now to um, put the filling. If my general dentist would have put the filling right at the time of the surgery, there would have been so much bleeding, it would have been a mess. So I wanted my general dentist to wait 
So soft tissue healing first. Look at this, such a nice pink, heel, pink tissue. And then um, she put the filling. Look, this is where I took the connective tissue graft from. This is the patient's roof of the mouth. And look how a month later it just healed. So this is how it is. My general dentist then put the filling here a month later and six months later, this is how the tooth looks. This is before the surgery. There's some decay uh, that you can see and a lot of decay underneath. And now it's all good, nice and clean. This, this was my dentist that did the job. So this is just a thank you to that dentist. All right, moving on to another case. I think this is a final case. Patient has no teeth. Patient has two implants here, but patient has really thin tissue, like thin biotype. So when the implants are gonna be exposed, the implants are gonna be connected to a big denture. Uh, and as a result, there's gonna be a lot of work that this implant is gonna do. It's gonna hold the denture together. And when the patient is biting and eating, the, the, the implants are gonna uh, counteract all the stress that's going down. So for the implants to be able to handle all that stress, the surrounding gums needs to be really healthy and thick. So since the patient had thin biotype and thin gums, we were like, why not do some soft tissue grafting right now before the implants are exposed and the, and the implants are gonna get connected to the denture. So what I did, I took this big fat chunk of nice thick tissue from the patient's mouth and I added it around the implants. So look at this, this is the implant that's been exposed. Look at this thick tissue compared to how it is. This is right now under the gums. But when I was doing the surgery, I exposed the implants. I did this surgery so that it's, it's gonna heal so much better. And then this implant is gonna be connected to a big denture. So this is something as a periodontist, I think that now implants are gonna be happy because it got, it got its nice thick tissue around it. So another indication when you do a soft tissue grafting, and this is a free gingival graft, meaning this graft contains epithelium and also uh, the connective tissue. Not the very aesthetic graft, uh, but you know what? It works in this situation. So this is how it looks before. Very thin tissue. You can see this is the two implants. You can literally see through the tissue. And look at this nice pink uh, attached gingiva that I've added. And this is still gonna heal more. This is barely six weeks after the surgery. In about six months, this is even gonna get so much better. So, so all right, so this is what I wanted to present. And uh, this was my uh, a little bit of information that I hope uh, made some sense to you guys. And I hope you guys enjoyed. And right now we are towards the end of the lecture. Um, just to give you some tips, uh, I have an Instagram handle known as a, known as Perio Node, and at this handle, I talk about periodontics. I I I put in my own cases, and in the comments section, I talk a bit about those cases, why I did what I did, uh, and then I I talk about that. I I put some. I'm very passionate about uh, teaching passionate about periodontics. So I usually post some of the dental literature and to be precise, some of the periodontic literature, some of the classic articles like, why as a periodontist, we do certain decisions, we do certain techniques. It's because we have literature that's proven it. So in, in my Instagram handle, I, I post my cases, I post certain dental literature. Last but not the least, I also post a dental uh, application related stuff. I also do a bit of dental counseling. I have a lot of clients that have no idea what to do um, and want to pursue dental dentistry in, in the United States. So I do a lot of counseling with them. I have people from all over the world, not just Americans, not just people in the United States. I get people from India, from China, from Nigeria, from Australia, and they really wanna pursue dentistry in, in the United States. Um, so I do a lot of counseling um, and I also post about it. I post about how to apply to dental schools, some tips, um, uh, the, uh, when you're applying for dental school. I'm also an admissions uh, faculty, meaning 
where I work, I review a lot of dental applicants. I, I review a lot of dental applications and I, I have a bit of knowledge where I can help uh, my fellow people who are interested in applying to dental schools as to how to strengthen their dental school application. And as a faculty, how do we review the applications and had uh, some applications we tossed them right away um, in the bin and then some applications we uh, consider them for the interviews what goes behind those uh, how do we select them what are the factors that we look into i post about them on my instagram handle so if you guys ever want to get some knowledge please follow me Perio node is my instagram handle um, and again, just don't, don't follow me. If you just don't want to follow me, you want to just ask me questions. This is my contact information. Um, this is my email address. I have a Facebook page by this name and I have an Instagram handle by this name. Feel free to reach out to me. I love helping people. I'm, I'm also an educator. Uh, apart from being a periodontist and I would love to help you all dental aspiring dental students. So with that, thank you all for listening. I really appreciate your time. And I hope I was able to add some something to your pool of knowledge. I, I hope I was able to motivate you guys towards dentistry and more so towards periodontics. I really love periodontics and I'm really passionate about it. So uh, I, I can keep talking a lot more, but I'm gonna end it here. So thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Sankar, for the great presentation. I'm just going to go ahead and ask you a couple of questions that we had on our YouTube chat. Uh, the first question is, is it possible for shrink gingiva to go back without surgery? Uh, you mean, is it possible for the gingiva to uh, raise? Yes. In some cases, yes. Let's say if you have a recession, um, in some cases, if you try to uh, do some, uh, some procedures like deep cleaning and you try to maintain your oral hygiene, you might get a millimeter or two just by deep cleaning and just by maintaining your oral hygiene. But not a lot. If you want like five millimeters, seven millimeters, you're not going to get that much by yourself. One to two millimeters, yes but you need to go to a dentist to at least get a deep cleaning because the problem is the plaque and the tattoo. You have to get rid of it professionally. So, yes. Okay, thank you. And the next question is that, uh, what protocols does the patients follow at home after surgery? So it uh, depends, uh, depends on the kind of surgery, but for most of my patients that I did grafting, I would tell them not to eat on that side, uh, chew on the other side, uh, not to brush for at least a few weeks, uh, not to floss. I usually give them a prescribed mouthwash known as chlorhexidin. You can buy this just by yourself. You have to have a dentist prescription. I would just tell them to gently uh, rinse your mouth so that you can clean it and use a Q-tip. Dip the Q-tip in the chlorhexidin and gently paint the tooth. Don't use brushing. The brushing might cause irritation just for a few weeks. And then after that, once I get the stitches off, you can slowly uh, start eating in that area. And then the other precautions would be don't eat anything hot. Don't eat anything hard like pretzels or pizzas, like that can really jab into that tissue. Like eat semi-solid, like porridge, soups, rice, things like that. Just for like a week, two, two weeks, depending on the kind of surgery. Okay, thank you. Uh, what are some dental research or literature that you recommend? I mean, again, it's so much broad topic. Like I can't just recommend your dental literature. If you're looking for a specific topic in that, uh, what I can tell you is periodontics. If you want to look at the literature, literature depends. It depends on procedures. It depends on anatomy of the mouth. It depends on fillings. It depends on specialties. So if you if you are passionate about gums, periodontics, go on my Instagram handle. I do a lot of periodontics literature, and most of the authors that I cite, they're classic articles, meaning every periodontist in the world would have studied them. So. 
that's that's my answer. Like I can just tell you one or two. There are like millions. But for your periodontics and for classic articles, go on my Instagram handle and look for those dental literatures that I read in the comment sections that I put. Thank you so much, Dr. Sonkar. And then there are two more questions that we ask all the dentists towards the end of the session. The first is, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected you, your life, and how you practice? It's been hard, I wouldn't deny. Like we didn't work for the first four months, but we slowly got it back and we are getting it there. It's not the same as we went back. And I think with what we've heard, it's still gonna be like this for the next few years. But we're getting there, we're adapting. Um, N95 has become the new norm. When HIV happened in the 1980s, we started using gloves. No dentist before 1980s used gloves, can you beat that? They didn't even use masks, but HIV caused them to use masks and gloves. And now COVID-19 is gonna cause us to use N95s. We can, I feel like we can never go back to regular masks anymore when we're tweeting. So just to answer your question, it is, it's hard. We are seeing patients, we are getting used to the PPE, uh, but I think it's just gonna get better with time. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. And I actually see another question that I, in the chat, they said, um, besides deep cleaning, is there any other way to prevent gum disease? Uh, well, go for a regular cleaning. A deep cleaning is usually a periodontic um, suggested um, procedure. So a dentist would always recommend you to go at least once, sorry, twice a year. And the reason why I tell you to go twice in a year is because no matter how much of a good brushing and flossing you do, there are certain areas in the mouth that your bristles cannot reach. So it's really important for you to clean those. And if you keep those in the mouth for a long period of time, that's where you get gum disease. So go for a superficial cleaning uh, every six months or at least once a year to get those uh, bad stuff off your mouth where your bristles and your floss cannot reach. So if you get a regular cleaning, you might never need a deep cleaning and you might never have gum disease. Thank you so much. And there is also another question asking if you had any tips for applying to Boston University. Boston University is one of the very, I would say if I have to do DDS or DMD, Boston University is one of the top notch you really have to work on your DAT scores, do a lot of community service, get some um, experience, clinical experience better, like observing in a dental office. I know it's hard with the current situation. So things like what you're doing right now, but I think it's the scores. They're really uh, passionate about community service and they really welcome a lot of diverse group. It might be a disadvantage to a lot of other people, but they really invite people of color, underrepresented uh, people like Native Americans, Mex like Spanish international students, just the model of the school. So if you are one of them, get a good DAT score and apply. It's competitive, but it is what it is. Thank you so much. And the last question we have for you is, if you could go back in time, maybe to before you applied to dental school and everything, what advice would you give yourself with all the knowledge you have now? I would be, I would uh, uh, make myself more aware of what dentistry is. At that point, I, one of my prime reasons to get into dentistry was I wanna make money. Don't get me wrong, I mean, I don't do stuff just for money, but at that point, like, yes, dentists make a lot of money. But trust me, there's a lot of easier ways to make money and a lot of less debt-free way to make money. So if you're into dentistry just to make money, don't get into dentistry, do something else. You're gonna save a lot of years and you're gonna save a lot of debt and tuition fees. So, um, and I didn't, no much. I was a dentist at the age of 22 because I became a dentist in India. So I was really naive 
compared to uh, people in, in, you know, in the United States because they have four years of college, so they don't really get into dental school until they are 20, 22. I was already a dentist in 22. So learn more, know what you wanna be. If you just wanna be a dentist, we want to specialize. You don't know that yet, it's fine. But talk to a lot of dentists, talk to a lot of people, um, get to know what you can about what it is to be like a dentist, how your professional life is going to be, how your personal life is going to be. It's demanding. It takes a toll on your personal life too. So if you're a person that you know, you want to have a family, you want to have a lot of kids, talk to people, talk to dentists that have those. Uh, uh, set realistic expectations. It's a really rewarding profession. You're not gonna make a lot of money right away. You're gonna be in a lot of debt. Be prepared for that. Try to figure out ways where you could get scholarships um, and understand what you're getting yourself into. It's hard. It's not like something you can wring it. You're gonna cry, you're gonna regret, but if you stick to it, it's one of the most rewarding professions. And for me, I'm more passionate about periodontics. So right now I can't imagine being anything else. So know what you're getting yourself into would be my advice. Talk to as many dentists, as many specialists as you can and know realistically what, you get, what are you getting yourself into. Thank you so much, Dr. Sankar for joining us this evening. And to everyone watching, thank you for tuning in as well. And if you take a look at the description box, you will see the link to the post-session quiz. And once again, thanks everyone for joining and have a great night. Okay. Let me... Okay. <laughs> Hi.